In simple terms, I'm going to put the proposition for um, our grandchildren, an increasing number of our grandchildren, living in sustainable mixed-use urban extensions to our great cities. And I'm going to do that looking at six things. Why we like urban containment in the UK. Why I think we should do urban extensions. What are the social, economic and environmental costs of an urban containment approach. I'm going to look at some case studies, I'm going to look at Yorkshire, and then we give some ideas for some actions. But I must make three points in introduction, and that is that I support Paul. 63% of our output last year was on brownfield land. I support finding as much viable brownfield land as we possibly can <coughs> and getting it built on by a range of different types of builders, both large and small. I support Toby. Garden cities are a fantastic thing. But this debate, to me, isn't about an either-or. It isn't about pulling one lever. It's about pulling every lever to address the statistics that we were told about in introduction. And North Stow is a great example of a of a major new development, it builds out at about 400 a year. We need 300 of those if we're going to get to 50% of the 240,000 dwellings that we need to build each year. So I would urge you, don't vote A, B or C. Get your pen out, write D on your form and put all of the above. So. The other thing I want to say by introduction is I support green belts. I think they're absolutely fantastic. And you might not think that after this speech, but I do. And I would never, ever want to see more than 2, 3, 4, 5% of the green belts of this country built on. Because I don't want London to look like Madrid or Los Angeles. But I'm going to come on to the risks of that later. So why do we love urban containment? Well... It's very common. We tend to, we tend to follow what the last, the last guy did, don't we? And of the top 15 cities, biggest 15 cities in the UK, only Leicester doesn't have a green belt. There seems to be a bit of follow the pack in this, if you ask me. I, I, do all of those cities actually need a green belt? Or did they get one because the one down the road did? I'm not sure. But we've now got 13% of England covered by green belt. We've got more land under golf course in Surrey than we have under housing. That's what the Green Belt did. And it's very deep rooted. In 1532 was the first Green Belt. There was a law passed. You were not allowed to build beyond three miles from Oldgate in 1532. That was subsequently extended to seven miles. And then, thanks to the Great Fire of London in 1666, that created a crisis of housing. And we thought maybe we'd better repeal that. And it was repealed until the 1940s. So just ask yourself the question, do you think Hammersmith and Fulham would be much better if there was a couple of miles of farmland between them? <coughs> I'm, I'm not sure there would be. It's very politically popular to stop housing. That's another reason why green belts are so ingrained in the UK. I went to all three political parties. I met a lot of people. Um, I met a council leader who was a Tory who was terrified of losing control of his council because Labour politicians locally were going to argue against housing. I met a, leader of a, a Labour leader of a council who was terrified he was going to lose council, control of his council because Lib Dems were going to argue against housing. It wasn't me, Barry. And I met, It was not you, Peter. <laughs> and I met a Lib Dem leader of a council who was, in a, who was terrified that next year he's going to lose control of his council because Tories are going to campaign about housing. So you can see, you can have all the national rhetoric you want. To, it was an arms race at the conference. Is it 200, 250, 300, half a million? You say what you want. But unless we sort out some local leadership, we're not going to meet that crisis. So don't vote either or. Vote pull every leader, lever. So... Why do we want to do urban extensions? Well, it, it's a, because it's all about cities. You will go a long way to find an economist who says economic growth in the future isn't about the growth of cities 
and the agglomeration effects economically that successful cities bring. People create markets. Markets create businesses. Businesses attract people. And so we go round again. We all saw the Evan Davis programme. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. And it's all about infrastructure. In cities, well, we already have it. You know, train lines, water, roads. From what I see about the public finance, it's going to be quite, built, quite difficult to build a whole new range of those. So why don't we focus our housing where it already exists? And it's all about propinquity. Now, that's a posh word, but it basically means that humans like to be near other humans. So I would say, let's expand our existing cities as a main driver of meeting our housing needs. Because it's really, it's all about quality of life. We all like to go to nice restaurants, we all like to go to nice bars, we like to go to quirky shops, we like to go to theatres that, that uh, show plays that aren't about around the mainstream. You only get those in big successful <coughs> cities and big successful towns. So let's focus on the cities and the big towns. So why should we do urban extensions? Well, the first reason is because a lot of very clever people say we should. Toby Lloyd there is a very, very clever man. And he did a very, very clever report with the KPMG. And it said we should review our green belts. The London School of Economics is full of clever people. They've got a whole team that's devoted to arguing the case for relaxing green belts in this country. Centre for Cities, they're full of very clever people. They're a left-leaning think tank. And they said we should relax green belts. The Policy Exchange, they've got clever people. They're a right-leaning think tank. And they think we should re relax our green belts. And the OECD are full of very clever European economists who went to Newcastle twice in 2006 and 2011 and said both times, you only have one economic advantage, and that's the space to grow. Unfortunately, they didn't know it couldn't because it had a green belt. And finally, <laughs> urban extensions, when done well, create fantastic places to live, fantastic places to bring up a family. Go to Dickens Heath in Solihull. Go to Wood and Ferrers in Essex. Go and see what places for people are doing in Milton Keynes. Go and see our development at Trumpington on the southern fringe of Cambridge. So why is urban containment bad? Well, it's bad environmentally because, unlike what Paul said, about intensive agriculture, it wasn't an, it wasn't an, uh, an economist, it was the 2011, 2011 government national ecosystem evaluation said intensive agriculture has less environmental value than the average domestic garden. And 74% of the Cambridge Greenbelt is flat, featureless, intensive arable farmland. There is no public amenity or recreational value in a golf course. They are bad socially, because people don't really want to live miles from their work. Green belts are creating a clear social divide between the housed and the not housed. Because green belts make land a scarce resource, and when it's scarce, it becomes very expensive, and the houses in green belts become extremely expensive. And that creates social exclusion. It means the children of people who live in green belts can't buy a house there. And it's bad socially because if you force all your development, why, there's virtually no schools in London now with playing fields. That's because of the green belt forcing all the development onto the precious spaces within London. And it's bad economically, urban containment. We waste billions of pounds financially and in environmental costs, travelling across a green belt. I've talked about the, 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 house, the, the effects on house prices with, and the effect of creating a scarce land resource, and the effect of that is that we build the smallest houses in Europe. Holland has much less space than we have. Their new houses are 40% larger than ours because they've planned for sustainable mixed-use urban extension. The Vinex programme delivered 455,000 houses in just over 12 years. And a final reason um, it's bad economically, because the market just gets revenge. 
build goes beyond the green belt. Build goes on playing fields in urban areas. Build goes on small schemes in villages with no facilities in the new development. I would argue our grandchildren should be living in the lakes of Dickens Heath and South Wood and Ferris. But what about examples? It's no good talking in the abstract. What about Manchester? 45% the Green Belt, 45% bigger than the whole of Greater Manchester. Great population growth in Manchester. But it's migrants, students, young people moving in. It's families moving out. A thousand units a year in the Greater Manchester Greenbelt. Nobody's suggesting that. We take 900 years to build on half the Greenbelt. And a thousand units in the Greater Manchester Greenbelt, if the Greater Manchester Greenbelt was a tennis court, a thousand units would measure five inches by five inches. Nobody is talking about concrete in over our green belts. Munich had a third less population growth than Manchester 2002-10, but grew its footprint five times as much as Manchester because it didn't have a green belt. It had an appetite for mixed-use sustainable urban extensions. And the figures for Marseille, Rotterdam and New York are even more stark, but I'm short of time. Um, Oxford. An urban capacity study for 8,000 dwellings and a recognised need on its own of 28,000 dwellings. Oxford City Council wants to meet that need, but it's got a brain belt, so it can't. And it's got neighbours who, who have no interest in building those houses. The LEP wants those houses built. The Schmar wants those houses built. Sir Plan in the 90s even proposed 4,000 to get those houses built. But we can't go anywhere because of Greenbelt and politics. London, where do we start? Where do we start? 32,500 hectares in the London authorities, this side of the M25. 1.6 million houses could go on that, at 50 dwellings to the acre. 20,000 hectares of land within the Metropolitan Greenbelt within 10 minutes walk of a rail station. There's another million <coughs> houses. There's probably a bit of a count there, to be fair. But instead, we have the London plan saying we don't need to build on Greenbelt uh, for the foreseeable future. But don't worry, I'll write to all hundred and whatever it is authorities around London and say, could you build our houses for us instead beyond the Greenbelt? A, that's not planning, that's non-planning. And B, that leapfrogging is not sustainable approach. And remember, on the, 5th of on the February the 6th, 2015, London will be, have its highest ever population. It will overtake its population of 1939. Newcastle and York are case studies. They're easy ones. Just copy them. Newcastle has done two green belt releases in the last 35 years. One of them houses a FTSE one, the HQ of a FTSE 100 company. In York, everyone in this room, in my view, should support James Alexander and what he's trying to do to meet housing needs in that city in the face of huge opposition. So what about Yorkshire? Well, I'm very hesitant here because everyone in the room knows more about Yorkshire than I do. So I'm going to ask questions and give answers. But two minutes to do it in. Council says it wants Greenbelt, but my applications on safeguarded land get refused. That doesn't tell me this can the council in Leeds is serious about building on Greenbelt. Brownfield, fantastic. Who's going to build it? We'll do it if it's viable, but a lot of it isn't, and nobody builds cheaper than us. So who's going to build on this brownfield land? We've got the economies of scale. And, you know, Leeds, be confident. Be like Birmingham. Say we want our needs to be met and chivvy the authorities to have them met. Don't say, let's just clamp down, down need. Um, I'm putting questions out. And finally, to finish off, conscious of time, what should we do? Say nothing till May 2015, because there's no traction on this whatsoever, politically at the moment, but build up ideas and evidence, and I hope I've given you some. What about a Royal Commission on Greenbelt? It was good enough for aviation capacity problem in the southwest. What about a bronze, silver, gold approach to Greenbelt? As I say, nobody wants to build on more than 5 to 6-7% of it. What about a requirement to put housing next to new strategic infrastructure investment? It's crazy we're not going to put thousands of houses next to the new crossrail stations. What about statutory duty 
to consult those in housing need rather than just listening to the NIMBYs? And what about making the duty to cooperate happen? And I think what they're doing in Greater Manchester is a great start in that respect. Thank you.